Hi, Anna. This is Tara Rye, and I just read your letter that's two pages long and a little bit into the third, and it was so sincere that I felt as if if I tried to respond to it with printed words, I probably couldn't give you the warmth and the comfort that you needed. And so I wanted to take the time to actually record a letter response to you. And so, dear Anna, this is my answer to your email. I wish we were sitting together. You were somewhere right here sitting beside me. See, I have my kitty cat resting in my lap. It's a quiet afternoon. And we were just drinking some tea together so that you could see and feel the love of Christ in me and through me to you. So I'm going to look at your letter as I reference and I'm going to respond to some things. Um, first, the thing that stuck into my mind is that you say the word fear a lot. There seems to be a lot of fear gripping you and that makes my heart hurt. I know that in scripture, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is not uh, a fear of that causes phobia, that makes us afraid. It's actually meant to be a reverence and an awe. It's about respect and honor. And so when we respect and honor the Lord, it's not going to make us afraid of being punished or being sent to hell or um, not being loved because we haven't done something good enough. The fear of the Lord is being in awe that he's creator and that he is bigger than anything I can imagine and that his love created me in his image and he created you in his image and respecting what he's done with that image and as his image bearer that you are precious and valuable to him. And when we have the fear of the Lord, our value is known. Our identity is secure. We're not afraid. We're not afraid that we're going to do something wrong. We know we're going to mess up. We're not perfect. We know that we're not expected to be perfect. And that he loves us because he created us. And he has good things for us and plans and purposes to use us. And he intends to um, grow us and he will convict us. He does want us to repent, to confess when we've done something wrong. But he doesn't want us to be upset at ourselves because of it and constantly condemn ourselves because he has no condemnation. He has forgiven, has given us forgiveness through Christ. And that was forgiven at the moment that Jesus died on the cross. And to say that that Forgiveness isn't going to work if I mess up tomorrow when today I have received and believed in Jesus is to then diminish the cross and what Jesus did on the cross. It was a gift that was done once and for all in that one moment when he died. And it was for my sins. It was for your sins. It was for the sins of all the world. And so when we believe in him, we have freedom and knowing that it's forgiven and he's not going to condemn us. He is going to grow us. The way that I have taught um, myself and those that I lead is if you could visualize in your mind that a big circle and in this circle, the beginning point at the top is the moment we believe in Jesus. At that point, each of us become an infant in Christ. And it's in our infancy that we need people to tell us what to do. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. But we don't just tell them. We have to do it for them because they're an infant spiritually. And they're not able to do it for themselves. And, and in this place and in this position, this is when our identity is made known. We begin to understand who we are and our value. And as we start to understand our value, that then begins to make us feel secure and not afraid and we start to establish um, well 
our hope and who he's made us to be. Once we understand that, then we move on into the next level, which is a spiritual child. And a spiritual child is brought into community and interacting with other people. Who am I with you and the church? And what does that look like in the body of Christ? And and how do I fit in? And how do you fit in? And how are we supposed to love one another, serve one another? And so as I have established who I am, then I begin to understand who I am in community. And, and as I'm in community, I start to realize, wait, I have something I can do to help this community. And so God then begins to put a hunger and thirst in us for us to discover our purpose. And when we begin to discover our purpose, that's when we begin to see, wait, in this community, I have something that God's given me that will affect the entire group. And if I do this, I can, I can help. I can serve the community. And then once I begin to grow in my purpose, I will mature to the place where I will actually see how I'm, I am actually called to build the kingdom of God. And that's when I become a spiritual parent. And a spiritual parent is someone that can actually help somebody know how to believe in Jesus, that Jesus has died on the cross for them and that their sins are forgiven and to find hope and healing in him and then grow in their identity so that they can grow in community so that they can find their purpose so that they can be used of God to build the kingdom of God. And leaders like to say that the person that is best used as a spiritual parent is fat. I like this. This is the one time we can actually say, I want to be fat. <laughs> um, I want to be a person who is faithful and um, available and teachable. That's a good fat person. Faithful, available, and teachable. And when I'm willing to allow that to happen, that's when God really uses me. Now, in your letter, I'm really sad at how afraid you are of hell. Um, that somehow that you could lose salvation. Well, I, I don't know what theology you've been taught, but I've been reading through the Bible since 1992, every single year. And um, you can't lose your salvation based on what I've read in Scripture. Once you've believed, you are marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit. He comes and He seals you, and you are His. Are you perfect at the moment? No, that you believe. Are you perfect in the process? No, no one is perfect. Christ is the only one that is perfect. But we're in the process of, as we're growing from child, from infant to child, to young adult, to spiritual leader, we're in the process of growing. And it's kind of like a spiral moving up. And none of us have made it. We're all working towards that growth. And so that's what he's doing, is he wants to grow us. And so you said you're afraid that your heart is so hard that that you can never be broken. Well, Hosea 10:12 is a good verse to pray. Um, I've prayed it in my life and asked God for it, that God would break up the unplowed ground, meaning like he would just take that which is hard in my heart and make it soft so he can put the seeds of righteousness in me so that he can raise up righteousness. Pray that. That's a good prayer to pray. And then I also noticed that you're so afraid about almost it sounds like that you think a Christian is boring and that we're not gonna laugh and that we're not gonna be silly and we're not gonna have fun I'm gonna tell you that's a lie from the pit of hell yes I just said that to you um, I think that as we grow and we we realize actually we should be laughing a lot more um, laughter will come to us easily there's a verse in the Psalms that says, let my gladness be in proportion to my misery. So to the depth of my pain and sorrow that I will have laughter to the same height and level. And so what we're going to find is that even though we may have trials and it may be hard, we will laugh just as hard. And that's what Jesus desires. And, and it sounds like that you feel like you have to work at this. And there's no working at it just going to tell you, I'm going to give you actually permission. Relax. It's not that hard to believe, to be
be a follower of Christ is not meant to be a burden. It's not meant to be something that where you feel heavy and um, not able to complete what God has given you. Oh, Anna, God wants you to have joy. And he wants you to celebrate and to laugh and to joke and yes, to sit with your Christian friends and talk about things that are happening culturally, talk about things that are happening on TV, um, recognizing and identifying, you know, this may not be so God honoring. Um, so maybe I'm not going to take partake in that type of movie or that type of program, but not to withdraw from our culture in such a way that we can't engage it. Because how will we ever be able to talk to somebody about Jesus if we're not even willing to have a conversation with them where they're at? I think that Jesus would be in those conversations and in those relationships, talking to the people after church or at the coffee shop and interacting with them. Now, in your letter, I kind of, oops, sorry, I kind of needed to shift. My hand's getting tired. Um, I also see that you're not sleeping and you you feel that it's affecting your body. I don't know. Have you been to a counselor? It's okay to go. And actually, I would say it would be a God-honoring thing to go to a counselor and um, to talk with them. And maybe you should think about vitamins. You know, I'm not a medical doctor. I am a doctor of... Um, I guess I could call myself a soul doctor. I do have a doctorate in biblical storytelling and or what you call ministry of education. And so doctor of the spiritual heart. And so the truths I'm sharing with you are actually the truths that God used to, to help me mature, to help me to grow. And Anna, you are so worth the time and the attention that, that God desires for you to have so that you can find laughter and hope and healing. Now they say that there are three types of villages when it comes to despair. You have depression, or depression I should say, depression, despair, and then the final one is hope. Um, you said you have no hope. And based on the way you talk um, in your letter, I think you go back and forth between the village of depression and despair. The only way to get out of that moving backwards and forward is for you to actually stir hope. And so I'm going to ask you, what are you doing in your life that is creative? What are you doing that's not you consuming and thinking about yourself and dwelling on all these things, but you are actually as an image bearer creating something. Do you write? Do you draw? Do you sing? Do you dance? Do you play with your animals? Do you walk? Do you go hiking? Do you do you laugh with your family, play board games? What is it that you do that feels creative? Because in our creativity, God actually lifts the spirit inside us, the, the releases, the things that make us have happy hormones, happy um, I just went blank on what they're called, um, dopamine and things like that. And so find a way to be creative. I can tell you, you're a writer. What you have written was real. It was raw. Um, it was poignant and it was deep. Do you know, God wants to call the deep out of us. And so I think that if you were to ask God to help you, I think you could become a pretty incredible writer for the Lord. I don't know. Anna, I have no idea if any of this will help. But if it does, I'm glad. Please know I didn't want your letter to go with me just giving a simple email. I felt it was worth taking the time to respond as if we were sitting and drinking a cup of tea or coffee together. I hope that... Um, the Lord meets you. God bless. Wait, I just realized I wanted to give you a verse. Second Timothy 1 7 says that the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. 
In some translations, sound mind is self-discipline or self-control. So what we have to understand is that he doesn't call us to be people who are afraid, but he has given us the strength to be courageous and to love and to serve. And don't be worried about whether or not you're dying to self or not during the day. Just choose to love somebody. And as you choose to love, you're going to find that it'll be easy to die to self and it's not a burden. But what happens is that if we live in that strength, that courage, and that love, we find that sound mind comes. And that comes through self-discipline and self-control. So studying your Bible, praying, repenting often, and then trusting that forgiveness has come if we've messed up, and to not condemn ourselves because God does not condemn us. Okay, now I'll sign off. God bless.